coming out. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at Novi Sad, and um, I'm excited to talk to you about how to make your video stream on the web, um, or the alternate title is uh, Video Killed My Data Plan. Um, so I'm Doug Sillers. I do freelance developer relations. I help people speed up their web pages and their native apps. As I just said, I wrote a book on how to speed up your Android apps if you're an Android developer. Um, probably not, but if you know someone who's an Android developer, that's the PDF so they can download it and read how to speed up their Android app. Um, if you want to talk about speeding up the web, whether it's images, video, or JavaScript or anything, um, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so I'm really easy to find. Um, so the subtitle of uh, my talk here is Video Killed My Data Plan. So I, I'm living in Ireland right now. I have a SIM from a carrier called Ear. And I was like, huh, I wonder how much it's going to cost when I come here to Serbia for my talk. And, the, you know, your roaming is automatically enabled for this destination, so you're set to go um, as long as you're willing to pay five euros a megabyte, right? Um, it's even more, I went to Russia last year, and year is 10 euros 24 a megabyte when you go to Russia. So we can use these as indicators as to how expensive a video would be if we play it while we're roaming. Now I get it, like roaming is sort of an edge case, but we always have edge cases when people are visiting our websites, right? I mean, there's always an edge case. There's always somebody trying to visit your website using a PlayStation or something, right? I mean, there's always gonna be an edge case. We have to be ready for these sorts of things. And if we look year over year, video is growing on mobile and on desktop. More and more websites are adding video. Um, there's a lot of studies showing that adding video increases engagement. It, it makes your customers happier. Um, a lot of those studies are built by companies trying to sell you video on the website. So, you know, take all the, 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 the studies for granted, you know, with a grain of salt. But people are adding more and more video. And as I talk to more developers are saying, well, as 5G comes out, we're just going to throw more video. And, you know, that's kind of a problem because not everyone's going to have 5G right away. Um, but let's look at what's happening today with video on the web. Um, does anyone use web page tests for their testing for performance? Anyone? Are a bunch of hands. That's awesome. There's a, a parameter inside web page tests. It was invented at web page tests. If you're not using web page tests, it's webpagetest.org. You type in your URL, you pick the type of device you want to test on, you pick a location anywhere around the world, it tells you how fast your web page is. You should check it out. Um, they developed a index called Speed Index. It's measured in milliseconds how fast a web page loads. So if you look at the median web page of all sites, 50th percentile, 7.8 seconds. But as soon as you add video, it's 11 and a half seconds. So websites that have video are slower. And all the research shows that slower websites uh, have less engagement, fewer purchases, right? People are get frustrated when pa web pages are slow. Um, let's look at the bytes. The median web page, when I did this, it was earlier this year, median web page is 1.2 megabytes. As soon as you add video, it goes up to 7 megabytes. Wow. We're talking, this is big. This is mobile as well. These are mobile web pages. Um, and, uh, and a sample set of 5 million web pages. Um, but the median number of bytes for video is just 2.5 megabytes. The thing is, as soon as you add video, to sites that have video on their web page also tend to have um, a lot more, double the CSS, three times the number of, I three times the kilobytes of images, and double the JavaScript, right? It's a much more engaging page. It's a lot more interactive. There's just a lot more stuff. It's going to make your page slower. Um, so as I was going through all of this data, I was like, huh, I wonder what domains serve the most video. And a lot of it wasn't surprising. You know, Akamai, Google Video, Cloudinary, Amazon AWS, CloudFront. I was kind of shocked that Facebook is number one with um, two thirds of all the requests on, on the web out of five million websites. This is a bug. The Facebook people would say it's on Chrome. The Chrome people would say it's on Facebook. We'll talk about that if I have time at the end. Um, but let's talk about what makes a good video playback. And of, you know, there's three primary metrics that people look at for good video playback. And it's interesting, this is from uh, Conviva, and Conviva is like one of the top analytics companies for video. And the first one is, did the video start? It's kind of important. Did it stall? We all know that when a video stalls, we get frustrated, and sometimes we stop watching the video. Um, and did the video look good? And my contention is, is if we optimize the videos for delivery, they'll download quickly, which means it'll start quickly, it probably won't stall, 
And if we do it right, it'll still look good. So video delivery optimization will make all of our metrics better. And so we should do that. Um, there is a study out there that says uh, people get angry and frustrated when a video doesn't play or if it stalls. And uh, there's another study out there that people throw their phones when they get frustrated with a slow web page, hence the picture. Um, but let's look at Conviva's data. This is from uh, Q3 of last year. And they actually found that on the desktop, 4% of videos just never played. And uh, you know, 2.5% just never played. Um, on mobile, and that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty high number. And so I went and looked at all the data in the HTTP archive. I found some 404s, some 500 stuff like that. Um, but like, why are so many of these videos just like not even playing? Like, you load the page and it just doesn't work. And my contention is, a lot of it is stuff like this, where you go to a web page, you're like, I want to watch this video, and then it's blocked because we're in Serbia and it's a U.S. website. Um, this is really frustrating. Um, there are ways to work around this, like the Amazon Prime uh, application. I have a Prime account set in the United States, and when I fire up the app on my phone, it says, ah, you're in Serbia. You can't watch these new shows that just came out in America. I watch them when you get back to America. Um, but here are the shows you can watch. So I don't even click this button because it wouldn't let me get there. It's like it's not available in this country. Don't even worry about it. Here's the stuff you can watch. And to me, that's a better experience because this is kind of annoying. If you open up Chrome DevTools, you actually find out that it took 231 requests and 3.1 megabytes to tell me oops. Right? So if I'm roaming, that's 15 euros to tell me oops. That's a little frustrating. All right. So the other thing that really blew my mind in these statistics is if you look, 16% of videos, um, people abandoned on mobile. Like they pressed play, it would have played, but it took too long and they gave up. And the number that's really astounding is like over a quarter of websites on the of videos on the desktop. People pressed play, the video didn't start, and they gave up. Like it would have started, but it took too long. And the reason it didn't, people are giving up, is you can see the average startup time on mobile is three and a half seconds. And in this data set, the average startup time on desktop was six seconds for a video to start up. And so you press a button, and if nothing's happening, you give up. And there's data to show that. Akamai did a study, and they found that everyone hangs out for two seconds. Like a video starts, or you press play, everyone will wait two seconds for a video to start. But after two seconds, you lose 6% of your customers every second thereafter. So if it takes three seconds, you've lost 6% of your users. Um, it's different for different types of videos. So if you have short play videos, like a video of a cat dressed up like a shark sitting on a Roomba chasing a duck, People give up on videos like that a lot faster because after three seconds, they're like, what the hell did I just click on? And they start evaluating their life choices and they move on, right? Um, but if you're watching a movie or a TV show, you're already sitting down for 20 minutes, for 40 minutes, for a couple hours. If it takes 10 extra seconds, you'll probably hang out, right? You've already sort of, you know, locked away a, a, a large bit of time to watch a movie. So, you know, people will abandon short play videos faster than long play videos. All right. Other interesting stats, looking at desktop websites versus mobile desk types, 19% of the videos are identical. And so, of course, what that means is you're serving either um, stuff that's going to start really fast on the, on the desktop because it's optimized for mobile, or you're serving desktop content um, to mobile devices. So it's going to look really good, but it's going to take forever to start up on a slow mobile connection. And, you know, honestly, most of it is... Um, optimized for desktop. So you're serving desktop videos to mobile devices. We don't do that with images. Why would we do that with videos that are like 10 times bigger? All right, so uh, here's some data to show that. Like here are desktop images, the videos generally are smaller. This is by percentile, this is by megabytes on the page. Um, let's look at video. The first thing to look at is look at this y-axis, 10 times bigger. And what's crazy is on these larger web pages, we're actually serving more data more mobile video data than we are desktop. So why are we serving more data to mobile devices than we are to desktops? So like this just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, let's look what type of files we're serving. We're serving mostly MP4s. The, uh, uh, this is WebM. Um, and then we've got some streaming here, and we'll talk about streaming as well. Um, this is a 
the baseball team, the Boston Red Sox in America. This is the playback of what happened the day before. This is desktop, this is mobile. It's the same video. I didn't do a very good job with my screenshot. Um, but it's a 17.6 megabyte video, same video uh, on the desktop as it is on mobile. Um, it's 960 by 540. It's 83 seconds long because it's a recap of a baseball game. And it's 1.78 megabits per second. So I was like, what can we do to make this smaller? Advancing. I downscaled it a little bit. Um, I use a tool called Cloudinary. It's a cloud-based tool. It's great for images. It does video as well. And I just set the quality to auto. Like, you take care of the quality for me. Make sure that it looks good. And what that does is it lowers the video quality to something that's acceptable. It lowers the audio quality a little bit. Again, this is a baseball game. We're not talking a music video. It's a guy talking about baseball. Um, and the file got 22% smaller. That's a huge improvement. And then I thought, well, what if we resized it for mobile? Right? A smaller size, people probably won't make this full screen. Um, it's 62% smaller, right? We can, there are ways we can make these videos smaller so that they still look good. Um, other funky things that I saw, I found web pages that this web page downloads, I can't read it from there, sorry, um, 250K on desktop and uh, 566K on mobile. Why are we sending twice as much data on mobile than we are um, on the desktop? And the reason is they're sending WebMs on the desktop, they're sending the Retina version on mobile, right? Do you really need the Retina version on a mobile device? You can look in their source, right? If it's Retina, serve the Retina. If it's default, serve the default. Like, you know, it's all there. It all makes sense um, until you get to their CSS. And the CSS says, oh, yeah, um, don't show any of the video to mobile devices anyway. So you're downloading 500K of video, of Retina video, and then not actually displaying it to the mobile users. They don't even know there's a video there. They're just paying for it. Um, now it's half a megabyte, so it's 250, two euros 50 when I'm here in Serbia, but still, like that's a little bit wasteful, so we shouldn't do that. Um, this is web page test. This is the waterfall diagram from web page test. Um, one of the attributes you can add to a video tag is preload equals auto. What preload equals auto does is it tells the browser, no matter what, download the entire video on the page. So you ever go to a page on your phone and there's a video and you're like, ah, I don't really want to click it. I'm on my data plan. I don't want to deal with that. Um, preload equals auto, the developer has decided for you and downloads the whole video no matter what. In this case, um, it was 23 and a half megabytes of data that was downloaded, um, whether or not you cared about it or not. So, you know, we're talking 100 euros, give or take, if I'm roaming here. Um, Let's see. Um, so, you know, if you know someone's going to watch the video, like if it's a background video, if it's going to play automatically, preload equals auto is great. If you're pretty sure, like 90% sure that the video will be watched, good idea. We should do that. But otherwise, we shouldn't use preload equals auto. Um, the McLaren website, they just updated their website. I just looked before my talk today. Um, but they were downloading on the mobile version, like a whole bunch of videos preload equals auto, they never ap even appeared on the page. So when you set preload equals auto and then you hide the videos, you end up just costing like crazy amounts of data. This one was seven. There was another one that was like 17. Like this, this page was just downloading crazy amounts of video. They fixed it though, which is awesome. Um, uh, this web page actually uses the, um, the preload to download a movie. So what's interesting about is when you use the preload tag, you're actually telling the browser, this file is the most important file for this web page, so download it with super high priority. And you can actually see there's the video, and it's downloading before the JavaScript, right? So it's actually slowing down. Now this JavaScript is taking a lot longer to download because we've got a video going at the, trying to download at the same time. It's actually slowing down the web page. This is definitely an anti-pattern, and we shouldn't do that. Um, preload equals metadata is the default. And what that does is it tells the browser, hey, there's a video, download the first 3% of the video. And that's great because then if someone presses play, there's already 3% of the video there. It knows what to do. It can start playing and then download the rest and you probably won't see a stall. It should be fine. Um, in this case, you can see we're downloading all this stuff and then we downloaded 3% of the video. And in this case, the problem is not so much that download 3% of the video. The problem is that it, with this one video request, um, we ended up downloading 2.7 megabytes of data because the entire video is like 100 megabytes. And so if you have a, like 
100 megabytes is probably too large a video to have on a web page, especially a mobile web page. Um, the video that was on this web page was, you know, two and a half minutes long, is 1080p, it was 97 megabytes. That's a really, really big video to show on mobile, especially when we look at the map of the page, it was way down here. Right, you had to scroll, like that's, that's like two flings with your finger to get down to this video. Nobody scrolls down that far to blow through 2.7 megabytes. Um, you know, preloaded because metadata is great, they should still be mindful. This is the default in all mobile browsers. Um, so the best practice here is you should avoid preload equals auto unless you really know people are going to watch it. Preload equals metadata is a good choice. Um, the other option is preload equals none. Whoops, I went too far. All right, so preload equals none. Obviously, by the sound of it, it doesn't down any of the, download any of the video. It means it'll take a little longer for the video to start up, but you're not getting all of this extra data usage on every single load of your page. So, you know, it's worth testing and seeing what works best for your website. Uh, background videos, I alluded to this a little bit. Like, this is a web page, it's got a background video. It's supposed to improve engagement, like people love it. Like, don't you want to take your kids here now? Like, it looks like they're having a lot of fun. This is awesome. Um, so I'm looking at all these different web pages and trying to go what's going on. One trick, if you don't want me to ever like highlight your web page, is name this video like background.mp4. I'm not going to look at it. This one was called Steven. I was like, huh, what's going on with Steven's video? Well, it turns out that it had Steven talking in the background. And 5% of the file is the audio track. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have used background videos, but background videos are silent, right? So if you remove the background track, guess what? Your video is going to be smaller and it's going to download faster. Um, so you should remove, not only mute it, because if you just mute the audio, there's still an audio track that takes up space. You actually have to go with the tool and say, I only want the video track and not the audio track. Um, but you can actually make remove the audio stream from the videos if it's silent. So if you have like a looping animated GIF, it's silent. You should use a movie for that. Um, if you have a background video that's silent, remove the audio stream. Um, this same video uh, downloads on mobile. This is the mobile view, um, but they hide it. And then they have a fallback, but they hide that too. They have a fallback image that's supposed to be here, and they hide that as well. Um, so if the viewport isn't going to support the video, don't download it. I sort of mentioned that earlier, but like it's a kind of a recurring theme just because it wastes data. This is like five megabytes, so that's 25 euros if I happen to be roaming in Serbia. Um, the fallback image is 900K that they hide, so that's another five euros that I just blew for a vi an image that I don't see, um, and it's all hidden in the CSS. All right, so one more background video uh, that we should talk about. This is for a web page in America. They've changed the video but it's still happening. So they update the video in the background that's in the background, but it still looks like this. Um, the first thing we learn about in this video is that Bob Ross also took photos. Um, this is the background video. This is the beginning of the background video as it plays, if you ever see it play, because it's 33 megabytes. How many people hang out at the top of a web page? Like, I wonder if the image at the top is gonna be a video. And I'm gonna hang out for like, I don't know how long, however long it takes to download 33 megabytes to see this video play. Um, it's 27 seconds long. How many people hang out to watch a 27 second video at the top of a web page? Yeah, that's too long. People don't care that much. Um, it's 2,500 pixels wide, right? That's insane. Um, and it's 10 megabits per second. This video is way too big for mobile or for even for desktop, frankly. Um, you should always resize your video to something that's reasonable. Um, Pro tip is even if you rename it 720p, that doesn't actually re-encode the video to 720p. Like sometimes the jokes just write themselves. It is new. Um, but if you resize this, like I uploaded it into Cloudinary and I resized to 1080p, it's eight megabytes. I made it 720p, it's four megabytes. It's big, but it's a lot more reasonable than 33. So you should always resize your video so that it's uh, something more of a reasonable size. Um, it also tries to download on mobile, but Chrome gave up after a while just because it was too slow. Um, so it did 17 megabytes of the video that I never saw. So, you know. 
Um, and so I keep alluding to like videos killing my data plan, like because I'm roaming and that sucks for me or other people who are roaming. But as developers, we also have to look at the server costs and the costs it, that are attributed to the video coming out of our data centers. Has anyone heard of Garth Brooks, the singer? Anyone? A couple hands, people who don't really want to admit they know who Garth Brooks, the singer is. All right, so this was his web page at the beginning of the year. And you can see it's got Garth, he's singing. And if you press the button up here, you can hear him singing. Um, I, have a, I had a, a, an extension where you can see like I can speed up the, um, the video. And if you look really carefully, there's another one behind there. There's a background video playing behind Garth Brooks singing. So there's actually two videos playing on top of each other right here, which is kind of interesting. Um, but let's look what happens in the dev tool. So Garth Brooks singing is 51 megabytes. That's pretty big, but you know, this is a very interactive web page. That's kind of cool. Um, the background video um, is seven megabytes. And then if you scroll down a little bit, he's got a pre-order GIF because there's a new album. It probably is out by now, but that was six megabytes. Um, but what I, what I want to point out is all of these are coming out of Amazon S3. And Amazon S3 is awesome, but Amazon S3 is not free. So Amazon S3 is nine cents a gigabyte. So every single time this page loads, it costs about half a US cent. Every single time this loads just in Amazon costs because it's downloading like 65 megabytes out of S3. So optimizing the video would have, could have potentially saved them a whole lot of money, right? This is an expensive page load. Throw in that, there's a bug in Chrome. And if you download a large video, it's not cached. And so this video of Garth Brooks loops, and because it's not cached, when it loops, it just downloads the video a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, as long as you leave the page open. You can see who filed the bug. Um, you can see when I filed it. Um, there's been no action on it. Um, and so you can see, I left the Garth Brooks webpage open for 20 minutes, and I downloaded that video five times. Right? That can get really expensive. Um, so um, you know, as we're going s along, you know, if you're retina videos, think about if you really need them on mobile. If the video is going to be hidden, you shouldn't download it. Um, avoid preload equals auto unless you're sure people are going to watch the video. Um, if the video is silent, don't have any audio. Um, if a tree falls in the woods sort of thing there. Um, don't duplicate video traffic, um, the, 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 like the bug in Chrome that I just talked about. Big files can cost both your customers big money, but can also cost your company big money. So think about that. Um, <laughs> I had a bug in a, in a Node app I was building, and I accidentally made 10,000 requests on a um, 90 megabyte video. Um, yeah. Oops. Um, respect your customers' data plans. So just think about all this. I mean, people are p actually paying money for all of this stuff. Um, I propose that the solution is streaming video. Um, streaming video solves a lot of the problems that come up when we just use MP4s, just like video source equals MP4, go, we're good. Um, so most people think, ah, streaming video, I'll just upload it to YouTube, I'll upload it to Vimeo, and all will be good. And they're great. If you're not doing a lot with video, these are great tools, right? You can just embed YouTube on your homepage and it works. But be prepared. Like if you put YouTube on your page, they just give you one link that you paste in. Um, you can expect a megabyte of JavaScript and other stuff to load even before the video starts, right? There's a cost to using these third parties. And actually, if you look, I built a web page that just had a YouTube link in it. And you can see I've got some CSS and JavaScript. And I believe there's two fonts. Yeah. And images, right? And they're all from different domains. So I have one, two, three. Like, oh, look at all the DNS lookups that are happening here, right? Like, there's a lot of delay. Like, they're doing their best to optimize it performance. But there is a cost to adding YouTube to your page. So. The other option is you can roll your own streaming. And so TS files are part of HLS streaming. So we're going to talk a little bit about HLS streaming and how it works. You generate a whole bunch of different bit rate um, and sized videos. And you, they're all listed in a manifest file. And a manifest file is sort of a menu that you send down to the, the browser and the player and say, here's what's available. Pick what's the best thing for this user. And so the player picks a stream. And it starts downloading segments. And the videos are cut up into little segments, usually like two or five or 10 seconds long. And they start downloading them and putting them into a buffer. 
And as the buffer fills up, uh, you know, that's sort of this little thing that we're used to seeing, right? Like as soon as we have enough video in there, the video starts playing. That's how video streaming basically works. And then as the video is playing, um, the player can estimate the network throughput. It says, oh, that file was one megabyte and it took X seconds to download. I could probably go to a higher quality video and it would still run. So it can optimize that video bitrate and then continue playing. And we've all seen this. Like when you start watching a video and the first three seconds are all pixelated and look like crap, and then four seconds in it snaps into something looking really nice, the video player is downloading a low quality to start with. Why does it pick a low quality? Because they start up faster, right? Low quality videos download faster, the video will start up faster. And then, oh, Doug's on a fast connection, let's get him a higher quality video. And then it, it delivers the higher quality video. So this is what a manifest file looks like. This is for a TED Talk. And um, so those are the video tracks. These are the video tracks in iframes. And then these are all of the subtitles. And I didn't look to see if Serbian is in there, but it might be, because there's a lot of languages that are there. Um, but let's just talk about video tracks, because that's really the focus here, talking video. Um, so each track, there's some information, like which audio track to play, the bandwidth, the program ID, and then you know the most important is the bandwidth here and the resolution. And so the first track to play here is 1.4 megabits per second, 640 by 360. And what most players do, if they don't know what the, the network speed is, is they just grab the first one. We're going to start with the first one, see how that works, and then move on, um, and then update from there. So in this case, it's grabbing this 1.4 megabit per second stream. If that stream is too high, the video isn't going to play, and then the player is going to have to pick a different stream. And so it can go back into, this, into the data here and say, oh, we've got, you know, this one is 228 kilobits per second. Let's start with that one. All right. Um, so then once it chooses a lower quality bit rate, the buffer will fill quickly and the video plays. The problem, of course, is if it has to change bit rates at the very beginning, we're adding time until the video is going to start up. And if it takes a long time to, for the video to start up, we know that we're losing our users. So we want to try to avoid this step at the beginning. OK. The other thing that's interesting is when you're doing streaming, you need to add a, a JavaScript player on in the browser to make it play. And by default, these are focused on bandwidth and not on the size of the screen. So like um, I built, you know, uh, I used a bunch of different players. And I said, well, let's use a really big width for the video and then a really small width for the video. And because we have all these different sizes and it's responsive, I expected that all of these players would be responsive by default, like responsive images, but they're not. Like HLSJS downloads based on the network speeds. So it was downloading 1080p video. Like that's the best video is going to look great, um, but it didn't save me any data. And looking at this, it, I didn't see any, the quality was too high. I could have gone with that lower quality video, save data, and it still would have looked awesome. You can see video.js actually looks at that and says, ah, 720 pixels wide, we should serve this video, 360 pixels wide, we should serve that one, and it was actually a lot less video that was being served. Um, you can add a responsive option. There are attributes that are off by default. So you have to go in and actually turn them on, and then once you turn them on, you can see like the video usage went way down, like even Shaka Player even did better than video.js, right? But and they all, uh, you can also see they all have slightly different algorithms as to how it works. They use a little bit different amount of data. But once you turn them on, you're going to save a lot of data. Your customers won't even notice a difference because the quality is going to fit the size of the screen. So you should use those responsive attributes to save data for your customers. That's pretty important. Um, so then you know, we, we know that a lot of videos don't start up. And a lot of times, it's because I sort of walked through this. We start with a low quality video, and then you end up with a high quality video halfway through. There are a lot of players that start with the super high quality video, go to the low quality, and then come back there. That's a long startup time. That's bad. Amazon does the Goldilocks approach. They pick the, they know that people are going to watch long play videos with Amazon. They know people wait a couple extra seconds for it to start, and they go with the high quality video. And we can see the differences here, right? This, when you start with the lowest quality video, the video starts faster than when you start with a high quality video. This video right here is the same quality as that one. It just took six seconds longer to run. So we should avoid that. Um, 
cool things you can do with manifest files is you can have different audio tracks, right? So green here is video, gray is audio. So you could have different audio tracks for different languages, for dubbing, whatever you want to do. There's lots of fun things you can do. Um, so I did a case study with, the, with a TED Talk, and it starts with this 1.4 megabit per second uh, bitrate video. Uh, you guys watch TED Talks? Hands for TED Talks. You know how at the beginning there's a, uh, the, the TED Talk sound? Um, you can actually see that. It's called the thousands. And so I'm starting, and it started here, and it dropped to the lowest quality video and stayed at the lowest quality video for the entire viewing. And it didn't look good. Now, granted, at a TED Talk, you're mostly listening because it's, you're not really caring about the speaker. But the video didn't look good. I'm like, what's going on? I was testing on a 3G connection. So I looked at the bandwidth, and it's 1.4 megabits per second. But then if you look, they're serving 600 kilobit per second video. So why are they doing that? the buffer fills up twice, two times faster than the player actually thinks it'll fill up. So this is to avoid stalls. That's great, but it's forcing me into a lower quality video. So I went to the opposite end of the spectrum where I matched the bandwidth to the, the bandwidth that's being served. Now this is gonna stall more often, right? There's probably a sweet spot in the middle, but let's just see what happens when I do this. The first thing we see, Y axis is gonna change, right? It's gonna start at 600 kilobits per second. It still immediately drops to the low quality, but then jumps up to the high quality. You know, actually, by the time the TED Talk has started, we're at the high quality. So that's pretty good, but like, why did the intro drop to low quality? That doesn't even make any sense. Like, we have enough throughput. I'm testing at 1.5 megabits per second. So I went and I looked, and they're doing all sorts of weird byte range requests here. So they're saying this is a five second chunk of video. It's a megabyte. This is six. Uh, seconds long, and it's like 100K. Like, that math doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, so I played around with that a whole bunch. I couldn't make it work, and I said, oh, screw it. We're just going to download the intro as a 12-second intro one file. Let's see what happens. And when I ran that test, it stayed at that 600 kilobit per second quality. And then by the time the TED Talk started, I was at a higher quality that I'd never seen before. So granted, this video may stall more often, but it looks a lot sharper. So there's probably a sweet spot in the middle where you can find an area where maybe you stay at the 600, it still looks great to your customers and it won't, and you can uh, mitigate some of your stalling. But you, you really wanna make sure that the quality of the video that you're delivering your customers is good. Um, so you know the movie, right? I don't know if the audio will play, let's see what happens. It's not gonna play, I probably turned off the volume on my phone. But or on my computer, let's see, let's get it going. I can't get it to work. All right, anyway, so what he's saying here is what's most important when you're fighting ghosts is to never cross the streams. Because if you cross the streams, it will lead to total protonic obliviation or something like that, right? Don't do that, it means the end of the world. So what happens if you've got a web page that downloads two streams at once? Right? They're competing for the bandwidth, so instead of having one at really high bandwidth, you end up at two with middling bandwidth, and you get lower quality video for both of them. You should not download more than one stream at a time. This is a web page that's downloading two TED Talks at once. Now, because it's the internet, and you can always find somebody doing something truly insane, this web page has 24 simultaneous video streams on mobile between 400 and 600 kilobits per second. In four minutes, I blew through 245 megabytes of data. And you can still see that a bunch of the videos still aren't loading. Like, this page is so big, it doesn't even work. I was on high-speed Wi-Fi, and I waited until all my neighbors went to sleep. I ran this test at 2 in the morning because the internet's faster in the middle of the night because there are fewer people on it. Web page still doesn't work. Like, this is such an insane web page. Don't do stuff like this. It's completely nuts. All right, and it looks like I have a couple minutes. I've got 10 minutes. We'll still have time for questions. I wanted to run through this Facebook thing. So why was Facebook the most popular domain for delivering videos in the 5 million web pages I was looking at? And have you ever been to a web page where like, they have the Facebook timeline like embedded on the web page? You can go to Facebook and they're like, yeah, embed your timeline on, our, on your web page. It's one line of code, right? Awesome. Copy, paste, you know, run it, and then you've got the Facebook timeline right there. If you post a video in your Facebook timeline and then you post your Facebook timeline on a web page in Chrome, 
um, it automatically downloads all of those videos. So it's like a frame inside, a video inside a frame inside your web page. And in this case, it downloaded like two and a half megabytes of video that no one's ever going to see. So it doesn't happen in Safari. It only happens in Chrome, which is why Facebook says it's a Chrome problem. But they deliver different content. So like they broke it for Chrome. Um, you know, just whenever you add a third party, whenever you do anything with video, whenever you add anything to a web page, you should really audit to see what's happening. In this case, um, the Facebook add-in of the timeline, if there's video in the Facebook timeline, it can actually generate a lot of content and a lot of downloads to your page. Video files are big. And if you mess up, like if you mess up with an image, like it could be a couple megabytes and that's not great. But if you mess up with a video file, like those could be 50, 60, 100 megabytes, and that can be really, really big and cause a lot of havoc. Um, you should resize your videos. Look at the quality, the bit rate, the dimensions. Um, if it's the video isn't going to show up, don't download it. Um, avoid preload equals auto unless you know people are going to watch the video. If the video is silent, remove the audio stream. It's going to make your video 5 to 10% smaller. Um, don't duplicate your video traffic. Um, streaming is probably the best way. If you're delivering a lot of video, you should use HLS streams. If you start at a lower bit rate, the video will start up faster. Um, if you want to start at a middle bit rate for vi better video quality, it may take a little longer. So you have to be careful about that. But it's going to look better at the very beginning. Um, use the right bit rates in the manifest so you can optimize that delivery. One video at a time. And then anytime you're using a third party, just audit it to make sure that everything is going well. Um, and so with that, thank you so much. Don't forget to respect your mobile users' data plans. And thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. OK, we have a few questions. Uh, once again, if anyone has additional questions, please uh, go to. Uh, to, 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 to our polls and uh, ask the questions or just upvote or downvote them. Uh, to start with, uh, what are recommended video resolutions for mobile and desktop browsers? So that's a great question. What's the video resolution for the browser? Um, you should look at your analytics, see what size devices are hitting your, uh, what content is, what size browsers and what size screens are hitting, um, hitting your site. And then also, look at how big the video is. Do you think that people are using it as full screen? Or are they turning it to landscape? Right? You may want to serve a bigger video if you think people are going to full size. Um, I generally don't go to full size, but that's just me. So it all kind of depends. It's probably worth doing some A-B testing to see what the right size is. Um, certainly, you should serve bigger sizes to desktop than to mobile. But you should really look to see. I, I don't have the right size. I know a lot of people do. Um, and it depends what you're using it for. Like if it's a background video and you're putting a filter over it, you can probably go to a really low quality or even low dimensions. So it really just depends on you know what sort of uh, how you're using the content on the page. OK, thanks. Uh, should we always go for Cloudinary or similar services instead of trying to manually optimize? That's a great question, too. So Cloudinary is a great service. Um, like YouTube is a great service. You know, the folks at YouTube, they know how to do this optimization. They're really good at it. There's that cost. Um, there are a lot of tools like Cloudinary that are great as well. They can do all this for you. Um, there are also tools off the shelf that can help you do it. So if you're interested in doing it yourself, you can roll your own. Um, it's really not that hard, but tools like Cloudinary do make it easier. If you have a lot of videos, you can upload them into Cloudinary, and they can do all the work for you. So. Um, the companies that I've talked to that are using tools, using Cloudinary and tools like them, what they find is because their engineers aren't spending time figuring out the right bit rates and all these different things, if they just let the experts do it, they have more time to go work on features, right? If you're not, if you're not worrying about how to deal with all the video and what are the right bit rates, and how, uh, you can actually go and work on the, the stuff that the company wants to get done as well. So, you know, your mileage might vary, but it, it can be very helpful. Okay, and you already mentioned the uh, preloading a video, but can you elaborate a bit more on that? So is preloading a video bad for, for performance? So one great thing about preloading a video, if you know people are going to watch it, is it's already all downloaded, right? So if it's all downloaded on the device, and then you're, they drive into a tunnel that's going under a mountain for like 10 kilometers, that video is going to play because it's all downloaded. 
They won't get a buffer. They won't get a stall. So from a performance perspective, it'll start up really, really quickly. Um, the trick is if only 10% of your customers end up watching that video, that means that for 90% of your customers, it was a wasted performance gain. So again, it's just something that you have to monitor and see what the right approach is. Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you very much.